Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Center for Global Muslim Life. This we're here today for the Diaspora of Hearts. We have a really beautiful gathering uh, lined up for you, and we're really you know with people from throughout the world. This is the first part in a four-part series where we really want to talk about what is the future of global Muslim life. How do we as Muslims connect? You know, through our hearts in this time where we're separated, and while our world is in this great transformation, how do we begin to think about the future together? So we have incredible lineup of speakers over the next four sessions. The first one is today, obviously, and the next one will be uh, on Friday, May 22nd. So inshallah, we, we're gonna start with Imam Ahmed Khan and some beautiful recitation of the Quran. He's the religious, senior religious director at Maryam Islamic Center in Houston, Texas. And he's also an advisor to the Center for Global Muslim Life. So welcome. Imam Ahmed, it's a blessing to have you. Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing to be here. Jazakumullah khair, Dustin, uh, for hosting this wonderful event. Um, and it's really uh, a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that during these difficult times, we're able to you know, connect the hearts even greater than before. Um, and I like to say this quite often, that you know, before the, 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 the doors of the masajid were open, but our hearts were not connected. Um, and the thing that was disconnecting us was actually social media and all of our emails and chats and all of these different things. And now that the doors of the massages are closed, in reality, the, the human family has actually come together. And I, I really do feel that our, our hearts have come closer together and they have gotten connected uh, at a deeper level to God. Right. Um, and we see this happening all over our social media platforms with all of our scholars connecting with each other, all of the different communities connecting with each other. Um, and this is why I chose uh, to recite um, a very well known verse from uh, Surah Al Hujurat. Um, you know, it, it's known as, as the verse of knowing, right? Uh, to get to know one another. Um, so, inshallah, I'm going to begin with that, um, and then I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes explaining why I really chose this verse, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya My dear respected brothers, sisters and elders, brothers and sisters, mashaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in, in the Quran, O oh, oh mankind, right? He's not addressing the believers, he's addressing all of humanity. He says that we have created you from a male and a female, 
and we have placed you in different tribes and nations for the sole purpose of getting to know one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says something very beautiful. He says, no one is more noble than the one who is closest to God. Now, a lot of times in our society, whether from a racial perspective or a societal perspective, we, we put you know, human beings in different categories. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chose a category that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself can define. You and I, there's no way for us to know who's closer to God uh, amongst ourselves, whether a Muslim or a non-Muslim. One of my teachers, he said that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows will happen already is. It's qualified just like that. So if we know someone who is not really on the deen or not even close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're doing all kinds of sins, but if at one point they're going to change their life around and they're going to become a friend of God, then even in the original state, they are considered to be a friend of God. And so we have no right to judge anybody around us. And so Allah says, Inna Allah alimun khabir, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most knowledgeable. He is the all-knowing and He is the all-aware. Uh, uh, he is the most cognizant, subhanAllah. And so... A lot of times when we look at you know the Muslim Ummah or the Ummah in general all across the world, we begin to uh, compartmentalize ourselves. And so this initiative here, MashaAllah, is such a beautiful initiative started by uh, a dear friend of mine, Dustin Cron, um, you know, the center of, uh, of Muslim global life, right? Um, this, is, this is really something integral. We have to really begin to start looking at what is Islam? Right, and what does it really bring to the table of humanity, and how does it elevate society? And with that, inshallah, I know that we have a wonderful talk scheduled about connecting the diaspora of heart. And so, with that, inshallah, I uh, I, I, I yield it back to uh, Dustin, inshallah. Zakallah, here, brother. And uh, so, so, yeah. Next, we want to show you a short film about our work. And and how we're really connecting hearts around around the world, inshallah, and what our and what our vision is. We've come from so many places on this earth, but our lives share a common destiny as we walk together. In a time of crisis or in a time of peace, this is a story of eight billion beating hearts. We share this one fragile planet, the air we breathe, the land we walk on, and the oceans we swim in. Imagine borders that surround us, some more fortified than others. Borders for many of us define our lives today. For global capital and those with the right passports, borders are easy. For the global masses, these borders tell us where we can and cannot go. For the world's two billion Muslims, one out of every four people on this earth, our lives are interconnected by the diaspora of our hearts, of our families, and a spiritual lineage that stretches back 14 centuries. But we are only told stories that put us in boxes to police our identities. What if the full story was told about our faith, about our lives, about our cultures? the story of our love for humanity and our stories as protectors of the world. This is for the future builders, the dreamers, those who want to escape from the futility of generations past destroying our shared world. Media has been built to divide us. We ask, what if it was built to connect? This is a manifesto written across screens. We need you. Beyond languages, beyond cultures, beyond faiths, beyond all barriers and borders, we need each other. This is for all of us. Assalamu alaikum, peace and blessings, everyone. So yeah, this is the, this this idea of the diaspora of hearts. This comes from the Arabic term madad, which is really about how we're connected to. We are all connected to a spiritual lineage, and despite us being at home, we're connected in our hearts. And so this is what we're really trying to build with our amazing programming uh, around the world, around the world, and and with the research that we're doing. And over this month, we've we've launched uh, a, a number of programs, right? Because over the next 
over the next 50 years, Muslims will actually go from one quarter of humanity to one third of humanity. So it's really time that we as people stop being reactionary and start thinking about what is the, what is our vision for the future. And I think that the difficulty of the moment that we're in is that is that there's a lot of pain, of course, and there's a lot of great suffering that, that we're in the midst of, but we have to understand that our world is in such a crisis that, we, that we're gonna reach a moment where we have to create a new world potentially. And so that's what we have to be thinking about today. And so that's why we've invited in this group of 20 speakers from around the world over the next four events to really talk about what does our future look like? How do we build it together as we move into this world? And so, so with that, you know, we've been doing a set of work. We've been doing a set of work that we launched here at the U.S.-Mexico border to say that we live beyond borders and we were physically at a border where only our pinkies could touch each other. We made a beautiful film about that called the, A Prayer Beyond Borders, and we're, we've kept that work going with the border mosque. We're raising a, a, a refugee bail fund to get people out of these detention centers where COVID-19, of course, is, is, is spreading very rapidly. We started a global Ramadan radio station that's been playing 24 hours throughout Ramadan with lectures and talks and Quran. I started my own series about the path and talking about our journey to Islam and really taking seriously the journey that converts go through because I think that it's all, it's always a marginal conversation within our communities. But what are the impact at a leadership level, at a community level that converts have made historically and are making today? We also started a live series and a podcast called the Ummah Builders where we're talking with with these Ummah Builders that we have on these this show today and people from around the world who are really talking about how they build institutions and how they move ideas. Uh, and then we have this series called Ummah Classics, with, which is a podcast with really classic, amazing, amazing epi, uh, uh, talks from around the world. And, and next is something we're really excited about, which is the Global Muslim Virtual Eid Film Festival. And we have an amazing set of films coming up, and that'll be from May 26th until June 21st. And so you can give to uh, our launch good. We really need your support. We're building, you know, a lot of people ask, why would we start an institution in as difficult times as this? But, but you know, as, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you're, if you're planting a seed and the end of times uh, uh, comes, you're planting a tree and the end of times come, keep planting. And so we don't know what our future holds for as a community, but we, build, we believe we need our vision, our thought leadership uh, at the forefront of, of where Muslims are headed. And so that's really why we're here, here doing that. And that's what we want to, you know, that's how we want to bring people together. Because again, this idea of our diaspora of hearts, the unique thing about Muslims around the world is that is that we're not really we're different in the sense that we are so connected in my opinion having lived all over the world having lived with muslim communities all over the world and i've been blessed to live in latin america and other places and a lot of people like my latino brothers and sisters my african brothers and sisters people are, are deeply connected to each other and have love for each other and throughout the world and we as humanity have love for humanity but the muslim community has deep love for each other we don't live our lives based on nation state lines we don't live our lives based on the false dichotomy that we've been placed in in the last 20 years in the midst of war on terror that we're just American Muslims or we're just British Muslims or we're just Malaysian Muslims or, or Singaporean Muslims, right? Each of these governments have tried to tell us who we are and how to keep within our borders for the sake of nationalism. But we know that our ideas, our, our films, our media content, it moves beyond borders because we love each other deeply and we have a great love for humanity. And we need people in this time, brothers and sisters, who love humanity and want to transform our world. And so with that, next, we bring in a brother who is transforming the world and who is doing really incredible work at the, at the Islamic Center of NYU. Imam Khalid Latif is, uh, is, the is a chaplain there and the founder and executive director of the Islamic Center at NYU. They've had some of the most incredible Ramadan programming with like 10 programs a day during this month. And so with that, we turn it to Imam Khalid Latif. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, good morning. Uh, Bismillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I appreciate the invitation to share space with you all. Uh, and I look forward to, God willing, the time where we can actually be in each other's physical presence. And I think it's important for us to recognize and understand that despite physical separation, uh, we don't have to yield to spiritual disconnectedness. But where we come from diverse and distinct backgrounds, individuals who might not have a uniformity of shared externals, but can be people who come together on 
principle and a uniformity of shared internals, regardless of who it is that we were born to or what part of the world that we come from, where and how spirituality, faith, race, class, ethnicity factor into our identities, to understand that there is no ideology, there is no way of life that owns values like love, compassion, our mercy, identities, justice. To understand that where I'm at in New York City, ideology, the there is last weeks have been quite difficult to say the least. And I would appreciate you all who have joined in today to take moments in the course of your own reflective periods uh, to send prayers and good vibes to the people of New York. Or in my own community at the Islamic Center at New York University, uh, we've had individuals who have either lost loved ones themselves or they themselves have passed, uh, approaching now about 75 people, let alone how many people have fallen ill. Uh, and in comparison to the city at large, there's so much that's there that's taking place. But what I would encourage you all to do in these moments of social distancing, especially through a blessed convening like this, where the unique effort and bond that shows us what can connect us by the example of the border church and the border mosque, and bring that into your social isolation and distancing so that rather than it being simply aloneness, it becomes a moment of solitude. And you start to take examples from everything that is happening around you because difficulties like this, things like we see that are taking place at the border, things that we see in terms of conflict, uh, abandonment of equity in places around the world and cities around the United States and elsewhere, those difficulties in and of themselves create deep opportunity and opening for us to see what it is that they intend to reveal to us. And at least where I'm in, in New York City, we've had a lot of revelations from this difficulty, both of things that stem from the immediate and things that have been deeply entrenched on a systemic and structural level since our country had founded itself centuries ago. There's revelations of real beauty and real goodness within the actions, the demeanor, the faith that I can't describe as anything other than real faith that brings doctors, nurses, residents to get up every day yet again to meet this virus full force, despite what it does to put their own lives at risk, but their sole purpose in the epitome of selflessness to just be there to help others because it's the right thing to do. That in my own community, we've lost four doctors who contracted corona while they were serving patients, hoping to be a source of healing. You see essential workers who are performing tasks of delivery workers, postal workers, grocery store staff, pharmacists, messengers, individuals who are forgotten but they are doing what they could do, many in large part because they have no choice but to work because of the need for the wealth. But in our day to day, it also helps us to not have simple disruptions to our daily routines. And the revelation that stems from those revelations of goodness and beauty is the unique paradoxical nature of humanity, that within us we have capacity to be agents of real good and beauty, but also within us uniquely is the capacity to be agents of real detriment and ugliness. And so too we have seen revelations of selfishness and greed, policy that is giving life to so much of what we see taking place right now. That how is it that we put billions of dollars in weapons manufacturing, we send protective equipment to countries overseas, where hospitals at the epicenter of this pandemic in New York City require people like you and I to dig deep and bring face masks to our health professionals on the front lines, and the government is not doing what they're doing. Self-interest, selfishness at the hands of electeds and federal government, and we see 
the unfortunate revelation yet again of how race and class dictate who has and who has not. And not just in terms of the last weeks or months or years, but even beyond decades, since the very beginning, systems and structures that disproportionately impact minorities, people of color, black people in particular, through a prism of anti-blackness, that we have to understand our role in being a source of remedy for. And the most important revelation that's coming for us, that wherever we're sitting and watching right now, is we're learning a lot about ourselves based off of how we choose to respond and what we've brought ourselves towards. What we have done, and more importantly, what we have not done. And I would encourage each and every one where you have opportunity, there is no shortage of going out and doing good because it's the right thing to do. That even if we look at the amazing work of the border church and the border mosque, what do you think is the reality of our sisters and brothers who are sitting in detention centers right now, many separated from family and friends and loved ones in the spaces that they are, let alone those who have no health care, those who have lost jobs and were already in financial struggle, those who find themselves in a space where they have lost loved ones and they couldn't even be with them as visitor restrictions at hospitals kept them from coming in in their last moments, let alone attending funeral services and prayers. There's no shortage of the opportunity to do what is right. You gotta just find it within here and be motivated from your heart to even in your homes, reach out and maintain a connection and be a source of assistance. And so as I close, I would ask you all to join me in just a short prayer. And whether you are joining as a person of faith or someone who does not adhere to a specific faith tradition, to allow for the moment to be one where our collective gains from each individual's presence to be devoid of distraction and to understand that you are exactly where it is that you're supposed to be and where we can yield from the unique blessing that is the one year anniversary of these two amazing groups of people and institutions coming together to do such important work. And we take that and we pour our hearts into a moment of reflection to say that what comes ahead, we will continue to meet it together in the best of ways. But if you can join me in a short prayer as I conclude and allow for us to come together in that spiritual connectedness, despite our physical separations. <clears throat> Almighty God, giver of life and guider of hearts, bless this gathering and all those who are in it. We have come today as sisters and brothers of all backgrounds to pay homage and remember all those who are impacted by difficulty, inequity, injustice, and hardship of any kind. Shower upon them and us your infinite mercy and grant all of us only the best in this world and the best in the next. For all those who are facing any type of distress, send upon them and all of us your divine peace. Guide the footsteps of our sisters and brothers afflicted by trial and tribulation at this moment, and deepen us in our trust, love, and care for them and each other so that we might come together to help them at this time. Send them only those who will be their helpers and supporters, and protect them from any further affliction, anxiety, ailment, or anguish. Open their hearts to receive all of the love that we are sending them on this day and envelop them in your divine love always. Grant them peace, relax their fears, and remove from them any impediment that keeps them from doing all that they are able to do. The burdens of life sometimes seem too heavy to bear. The anxiety and anguish that sits inside of us feels bigger at times than the world around us. We seem to be surrounded by a darkness that's impenetrable. Today, we ask you for the sake of all those who need us to be better than our best to give us courage. Our struggles are real, but your promise is true. Indeed, with hardship, there always comes ease. 
Remove from our hearts any fears or inhibitions and replace them with an ever-increasing boldness to live each moment as best as we can. Fill our hearts with a fire of your love and a desire for nothing less than justice for all. Make us the conveyors of truth, the purveyors of truth, the couriers, the carriers, the upholders of truth. Let us not be swayed by false fulfillment, but make us from amongst those who taste true contentment. Let us never be those who a strong fear of loss in this world or hope of gaining some portion of it keeps us from speaking out and hearing the truth that we yearn for. Keep us from being silent when others lie and help us to never lie to ourselves consciously or unconsciously. The difficulties and hardships of the days that surround us create deep opportunities for revelations of all kinds. It has shown us the potential for greed and selfishness that exists amongst those whose interest is only self-interest. It has shown us the beauty and courage of those who stand day in and day out at the front lines against it. It has shown us inequity in its ugliest of forms and how race and class still dictate who has and who has not. And it has shown us who we are based off of our responses to everything it has revealed. Help us to find meaning in these revelations, whether they are revelations of comfort or discomfort. Put strength into our voices and grant us the courage to express our feelings, to love, to let those that we love know how valuable they are to us to seek forgiveness from those that we have wronged and to exert mercy towards those who have wronged us. Help us to see this world always through hearts that are drawn towards goodness, to silence fear and abolish anxiety, to overpower indifference and break away from greed, to eliminate arrogance and defeat racism, to be bold enough to ask of you to make us those who only do that which is good. Help us to never fear the path of truth for the lack of people walking on it and bless us with leaders to follow who walk firmly upon it. Thank you for our sisters and brothers at the border mosque and the border church. Help us to take from their example. Let our unity be not tied to uniformity of the external, but instead make us people of all colors in our uniformity based off of a uniformity of values and hearts. Remove from our hearts any negative thoughts of others and help us to never partake in acts of injustice against people of any background. Even if no one else speaks, help us to always speak against any oppression, even if it is against ourselves. When we look back to these days of social isolation, make us those who look back with full assurance knowing we did everything we could in our capacity to help others and did not leave anything behind where people are passing away and many more are falling ill, where so many have lost jobs and have no means for rent, food, clothing, or anything at all, where government has failed and children's schools have become distribution centers, where hotels and dormitories have become hospitals and operating rooms, where... A little bit of technical difficulties we're getting in the the next speaker up thank you imam khalid amin 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 such a beautiful dua such a powerful dua echo and dr hatam we have dr hatam salam alaikum dr hatam alhamdulillah so we can go to dr hatam i'm sitting here talking about the film festival coming up because we we've been having uh, some issues with with our sister ismahan's uh, audio so we'll keep trying to figure out ismahan's audio and we're going to go to dr hatam so Dr. Hatem Bazian, of course, is a professor at UC Berkeley, and he's the founder of the Islamophobia Research Center in Berkeley as well, the documentation and research project in, in Berkeley. He's done really, really incredible work all around the world, including all these different decolonial forums and global Islamic thought. And so we, he's been an advisor on this project, the Center for Global Muslim Life, since I started thinking about it when I moved back from Malaysia in the beginning of 2018. He was really the first person I went to to talk about the project, and he's been uh, fully supportive ever since then. And we really appreciate you coming on. And we wanted you to talk about the future of Palestine, especially as we're on this 72nd anniversary of the Nakba. So Dr. Hatem, take it away. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Dustin, and assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to, uh, to see your project coming uh, to fruition and beginning to take shape. Uh, institutional building, uh, it's a long journey. It takes many turns, ups and downs, U-turns, and uh, all types of uh, uh, circumstances. But inshallah, 
uh, that uh, we're beginning to put the building pieces uh, on uh, the ground. And uh, this is a blessed month uh, for such a project to take shape. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you tawfiq. Uh, uh, the question of Palestine, uh, 72, year, 72 years of uh, ongoing Nakba, uh, the Nakba has never stopped, it continued. Uh, I speak about a typical uh, Palestinian family uh, that possibly been ethnically cleansed uh, from uh, Palestine in 48, uh, seeking refuge in uh, 67 in uh, possibly a refugee camp. Uh, then 67 war comes, they move to Jordan. Uh, another war in Jordan in 1970, Black September. Uh, they end up in Lebanon. Then they find a job, relocate to Kuwait. U.S. invasions to Kuwait and Iraq invasions to Kuwait, the U.S. war with Iraq, they end up in the uh, empty quarter. And then uh, as a result of all types of political and diplomatic maneuvering, end up having a green card refugee status to come to the United States. And in the U.S., they face uh, intrusion uh, CVE, counter-violence extremism, surveillance, uh, interrogation, and all types of uh, really otherization. So when we speak about Palestine and the future of Palestine, uh, we have to think of where the history of Palestine starts and begins uh, relative to the modern history and uh, where the future uh, should take us uh, in this sense. Uh, Palestine is the last settler colonial project uh, to be commissioned in the 20th century. At the end of uh, World War I, uh, while the world uh, was ushering the end of direct colonization, uh, the British uh, saw fit uh, to uh, establish a, a settler colonial project in Palestine. And as such, Palestine's uh, Nakba begins uh, with the issuing of the Balfour Declaration in 1917. And from that moment on, uh, Palestinians have been in an encounter of a continued uh, process of dispossession. In order for us to move to what the future looks like, we have to say that the only way forward to, to engage the question of Palestine is through a decolonial understanding. Any other understanding, the notion of uh, the two-state solution that was put forth, which is, in, it was itself uh, a Zionist idea uh, in the 1930s, uh, to think of a two-state solution that is uh, thought of within a scope of demographics and sc scope of uh, controlling and uh, setting up Bantustans for the Palestinians uh, is a non-starter. So the starting point for any type of work and engagement of Palestine for the future uh, is on the, on the foundation of a decolonial uh, understanding. Second, the key issue of Palestine as we speak uh, is the right of return of uh, the Palestinian refugees. Uh, we still have the majority of Palestinians that have been evicted from Palestine uh, are living in refugee camps, refugee camps in the West Bank itself. 90% uh, of the Palestinians in Gaza are refugees that were expelled from their homes, lands, and properties. Uh, there is refugees in Jordan. Uh, there is refugees in Lebanon. Uh, in uh, Syria, and then a scattering of the surrounding Arab countries. Then you speak of the uh, Palestinians that are in the Western world, uh, also in the Southern Hemisphere in Latin America, large uh, Palestinian population in El Salvador, in Chile, in Argentina, and other places uh, that has been uh, a really a part of the expulsion that the Palestinians 
have uh, been experiencing since the Nakba. So the refugee and the right of return of the refugees to, to their lands, to their property, to their homes is the second part of thinking in uh, the future aspect uh, relative uh, to Palestine. The third element is to, for us to uh, be very critical uh, of the attempt uh, to think of Palestine in uh, speculative theology, millenarian type of thinking, that unfortunately not only that uh, you find it among Western Christians, but I think also some within the Muslim world have also adopted a particular type of lens to approach Palestine, uh, meaning that there are so many that uh, uh, approach Palestine banging the uh, end of time and end of the world uh, type of scenarios and begin to act in politics and in, in, in political engagement with that in mind. And I think this is highly, highly problematic as a way. This doesn't mean that we don't have a religious affinity and attachment and have a religious foundation to Palestine, it does. Uh, but the speculative theological uh, understandings and begin to act as if you are God uh, uh, in your uh, engagement uh, is a very problematic way uh, to engage in the Palestinian question. Uh, this gets into this whole notion of, use, of using uh, the interfaith space or what I call faith washing as a way to engage because it assumes or it takes as a point of departure, not a, a, a colonial structure, a settler colonial, but see it's only through the theological dimension and begin to think that only the religious text itself to act and engage it in a speculative way uh, is uh, the way to move forward. And I think that is very problematic. So for both Muslims and our allies that are engaging in Palestine, we want your solidarity, but we're not accepting nor welcoming your speculative theological engagement, no matter what the speculative theological engagement that is taking place. We have deep faith and deep uh, trust and understanding of our Islamic engagement, but we also have to be very clear of where individuals are actually taking that they are God rather than trying to say understanding or interpreting or approaching it uh, in that way. So that's a third element in there. And in this sense, also to uh, distinguish between the uh, uh, evangelical Christian right in the U.S. and its partnership with uh, the uh, right-wing Zionist versus the Palestinian and the Arab Christian uh, population. Uh, we tend to fail uh, to recognize that the history of solidarity and collective work between uh, Palestinian Muslims, Christians, and uh, Christians of the Arab world uh, to oppose colonialism and to be in the forefront of challenging uh, colonial structures. So as we move forward, not to fall and to begin to understand that our narrative, how we engage has to be an inclusive as well as a welcoming and not to allow the divide and rule tactic that has been used uh, often uh, to rear its ugly head again. And this also can be applied in other areas. In particular, uh, I've been working in a, in a deliberate way to uh, bring the Sunni and Shia Muslim community together uh, through an intra-faith uh, approach. Uh, because, again, there are many that are attempting to uh, instrumentalize uh, Muslim sectarian uh, understandings and division as a way of trying to push uh, divide and rule, both in the Muslim world, uh, but also uh, here in the West as well. So for me, those elements are very critical if you want to engage uh, in Palestine uh, to assert that our unity is the, is the important critical piece. Uh, both unity within the Muslim community, but also unity within the broader uh, 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 Arab and Muslim world to engage in, in issues relative to Palestine, but also I work in solidarity with the Syrian, with the Yemenis, with the Somalis, Afghan, uh, the Uyghur, uh, the Rohingya, especially also the Muslims in India with what's taking place in Kashmir, uh, the Muslims in uh, 
uh, even in Africa and Mozambique and other places where they're facing challenges. So we have to be both local and transnational, and the Palestinians have always had an eye on the local and transnational. That's why it was natural for them to engage in the uh, anti-apartheid struggle and be connected to the ANC. It was very uh, critical for the Palestinians to be engaged with the solidarity movement with El Salvador uh, during the period of U U.S. intervention and also uh, engaging in solidarity uh, across uh, even European with the Irish struggle and uh, in Spain and other places. So that's the dynamics relative to the future. I think continue to push on those four elements uh, that uh, I uh, mentioned. Uh, on a positive end, I think the PDS movement has been very, very uh, important uh, element and uh, the success is a result of the large number of activists uh, that have engaged uh, on the PDS, boycott, divestment, and sanction. And for anyone who's listening from the Muslim community, uh, one of the organizations I lead, which is American Muslims for Palestine, we have been taking the lead in the date boycott. Uh, there's no reason for you to break your fast uh, in Ramadan by buying dates that are uh, coming from Israeli settlers and settlements and from Israel. So we need to make sure that you access to see which brands uh, that are uh, Israeli products and especially in Muslim uh, space, Muslim grocery stores and places that we don't allow ourselves to, in essence, uh, be uh, breaking our religious uh, uh, dedication in Ramadan by actually biting on something that is coming from an apartheid uh, state. So those are uh, my thoughts that I wanted to put in circulation for you. And uh, hopefully that would be uh, what uh, at least get the conversation going. Hey, Dr. Hatem, uh, it's really beautiful uh, to have you. It's a blessing to have you. And I think that Palestine and Palestine, Palestinian solidarity around the world is a great example of the diaspora of our hearts and how our hearts are connected and the struggle is connected everywhere I've lived in the world, everywhere I've traveled in the world, whether it's in Malaysia and Indonesia, even in, you know, Mexico and Morocco and in Ghana, there's Palestinian flags and free Palestine flags everywhere. And so, so we as a Oma pray and we as a people pray for, for the, the freedom of Palestinian people and the transformation of the situation, inshallah. So next. Salaamu Alaikum. And so next, we're going to go to Sister Sister Isma Han Abdullahi, uh, who we tried to get to earlier. She's the but but now we're blessed to to have her sound fixed. She's the director of national director of Mass Pace. It's a real honor to have you. If you could talk about what a future uh, beyond bands looks like from your eyes. Yeah, Jazakumullah khair and a'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Such an honor for me to join you all. Uh, Subhanallah. Before I start my um, a talk or just short reminder i really want to ground us and i really want to lift up um uh, our dear scholar our dear brother hatim bizian subhanallah i remember 10 years ago when we invited you for our msa activities at ucsd just the nature of the conversation has shifted and it's not something that has happened overnight for the dominant discourse of when it comes to Palestine to be shifted, but it's because of the important work that individuals such as Dr. Hatim Bizian are doing that the conversation continues to evolve, um, subhanAllah. So I really want us to ground ourselves in understanding that here in America, we must understand that we're living in a country that was built on the backs of stolen people and on the backs of stolen land. So we talk about putting forth bans or immigration policies that are meant to keep out certain individuals or certain faith groups or certain ethnicities. We have to ground ourselves in that understanding of how the United States came into being, um, subhanAllah, as a country. And when you recognize that for the longest time that the individuals who have uh, have been burdened with the brunt of the policies of hate, the policies of xenophobia, the policies of Islamophobia have been our black and brown communities, have been communities that have been the forefront of having their children being torn from them 
their bodies used, subhanAllah, misused and practiced on for medicine, um, and really thinking about what have we put a ban on. The Muslim ban, as we understand, is this ban that came on the backs of so many other hateful policies that were meant to keep out folks that are not considered to be white, that are not considered to be privileged. I mean, subhanAllah, when this COVID pandemic broke out and there was that short European ban that was put into place by this by this administration, a lot of the images that were used were messages in Turkey. And these are mainstream media, right? Um, which leads us to a larger conversation about uh, Islamophobia in general. But what I really wanna to touch upon is our, across the nation, people of conscience have been waking up and recognizing this dilemma of understanding how can we build towards a future that is just a future that is virtuous, a future that has no borders, that has no ban, where we're really seeing human beings for who they are in a dignified way, and how the continuous fear mongering, the continuous xenophobia, Islamophobia, and racist rhetoric um, is detrimental, not only to the communities that is directed at, but also the future of this nation, especially when it comes to the refugee and Muslim bans, whom a lot of the recent uh, uh, bans have targeted. So when I was studying the civil rights movement back in 1960s, the civil rights movement in the 1960s, I used to ask myself if I lived during those times, would I sit on the sidelines or would I be out there marching for justice? So in this future that we're envisioning, this better world that is more just and more equitable, my question to my fellow uh, brothers and sisters all over the world and everywhere has always been simple. Will you use your voice? Will you use the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to rise to the moment, to rise to the occasion and demand and fight for justice on a local and national and a global level. Because the reality is what this pandemic has showed us is how interconnected our world is and how global we are. That when we talk about freedom and justice in one specific area, whether that be Palestine or in the streets of Southeast San Diego, or subhanAllah, what recently has has happened in Georgia with the shooting of our dear brother Ahmed Arbery, what we're talking about is a human race that's connected, where one part of the world feels pain, it impacts everybody. And we know that we're operating in this system of white supremacy that continues to profit and has capitalism as its knight in shining armor to kind of continue to maintain uh, the status quo as is. So I wanna leave you with a quote, and please Justin, let me know if, if I'm short on time. I wanna leave you with a quote. Arundhati Roy, an activist whom I respect a lot, has said this quote, and ever since I read it, it just really hit me different. Um, SubhanAllah, she said, I can, um, I can, another world is on its way. And on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Recognize that the future that we are working towards the future of understanding that justice and equity are norms and not just terminology um, that is that is safe for specific folks within our community, that despite the elements of darkness around us in the times that we are living in, our communities are resilient. They have been resilient. The fight for justice and equity will always continue. And that despite the, the, the struggles that we face, despite the pains that is afflicted in our communities, the children that are caged, um, subhanAllah, and just the continuous disenfranchisement and marginalization of, of our communities, that there is that better day coming. But the fight that we're engaged in is a marathon and it's not a sprint. So I invite you to really envision this better world where we continue to stay connected, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that subhanAllah, he raises as the best nation for mankind because we enjoin that which is good and forbid that which is evil, um, subhanAllah. So taking that commandment that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us to really work together, coalesce together, continue to uplift the very core values and principles that connect as his human beings and also more intimately connect us as believers to envision that better world that is connected and lifting up the very people that we have been um, 
subhanallah kind of expected to overlook to build a better world together inshallah so i invite you all to that um and constantly think about what role are you going to play in a lot of the other speakers mashallah they touched up on beautiful beautiful sub subjects but i always want to direct it back towards you when the prophet والسلام, was commanded ya ayyuhal muzammil qum al-layla illa qalila like subhanallah all you who's wrapped up in cloaks uh, get up to pray for most of the night he was also commanded ya ayyuhal mudaththir qum fa'andir or you who's enveloped in cloaks get up and warn so it is our duty as muslims to really think about how and what role are we playing to usher in this better world because for some of us it might be a privilege to take a step back but for some of us this means life and death for our very communities for our very families for our individuals for me personally i'm in this fight and i am deeply invested in building a better world i'm deeply invested on uh bringing on good trouble as i call it is because i know that my life my family's life and the lives of so many people whom i love whether i know them whether i don't know them is at stake and is on the line um so subhanallah i'm inviting you to think about you know when you talk about the global muslim world when you talk about the ways that we're different that, that we're connected come back to this core point of how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to be those vice chairs on this earth to be those individuals when corruption and uh, has spread through the land and the sea that we are the best of nations to ever have been raised from mankind because we enjoy that which is good and forbid that which is evil so jazakumullah khairan jazakumullah khairan sister ismahan really beautiful talk and, and I mean, I think it's so important that we think in these times that we just don't know what's next, right? And, I, and, and as you said, we have to be prepared to be protectors of even our neighborhoods. And I think a lot of the massage at a lot of community groups like um, Pillars of the Community in San Diego is an example. Have a lot of massage have really stepped up and are offering food or offering you know, frontline services uh, in the midst of this pandemic. So we pray, for, we pray for you and we pray for everyone who's doing this work. I mean, inshallah, may Allah bless you, inshallah. Next, we're going to, to our sister, Maryam Kashani, who's one of the founders of the Believers Bailout. And we were honored to be on, on her program uh, a few weeks back. I know they still have a launch good that's live. So please give to the Believers Bailout as we need to get people out of prison. That's really a, a death. If it's a death sentence before, it's a death sentence in, in many ways now with COVID, both at the immigration detention centers and at, at, at jails throughout the country. She's also an assistant professor of gender and women's studies and Asian American studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And, you know, she, this sister really inspired me, Sister Miriam. I knew her at my time at, at Zaytuna College. And at that time, she was studying the college and doing her, her dissertation and making a film. And it helped me connect dots in my mind of, oh, wow, I, can, I don't have to just be an academic. I can also do film work and I can also, um, you know, do media work and really think about how we tell stories in, in many different ways. So multi-talented, Miriam Kashani, we turn it to you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum Thank you. Um, it was a little embarrassing. Um, so I'm gonna take these out because I'm hearing an echo. Um, so salam alaikum. Thank you um, for inviting me, um, Dustin. It's been, it's a real honor to talk amongst such esteemed guests. Um, I'm, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the um, Believers Bailout Project um, and the situation that we're trying to address as an abolitionist organization in terms of trying to imagine and enact a future without prisons and a future without policing as well. Um, so Believers Bailout started two years ago, two Ramadans ago in 2018, a group of Muslim women scholars and activists and community members were really inspired by the bailouts that were happening around Mother's Day um, and thought that we could use some of the systems we have, the structures we have within Islam to address what we saw as a systemic problem in our society, which is um, one, the prison industrial complex, um, the system that connects our, and that organizes our society around punishment, around carcerality, uh, uh, around policing and, and things like that. Um, and, to, 
and to think about what Muslims are required to do to respond to the injustices of that particular system, which we know targets uh, black and brown communities at a much higher rate and also punishes people for being poor. Um, so we decided that, you know, zakat as an, a really important pillar in our faith is, um, is really supposed to be used to, you know, one, purify wealth, right? Um, but then also to really restore the vulnerable in our community so that they can be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. Um, and so zakat for us seemed like a really great sort of systemic um, structure that we have in our system to address a systemic problem. Um, so we decided to start collecting zakat to bail out Muslims out of pretrial detention. Uh, pretrial detention is one of the really horrific parts of the prison industrial complex in which people are basically punished for being poor. They are punished um, and incarcerated prior to trial, prior to being found guilty of any crime um, because they can't afford to actually pay a money bail. So when you hear of someone being in a jail, that means that they're being incarcerated prior to being convicted of anything. Um, and with the kind of system we have that says that we are innocent until proven guilty, this is a direct contradiction in the system. Um, so we use Zakat to pay money bail for folks so that they can not be in jail while they're fighting their cases and also rebuild their lives at the same time. Um, we have been paying bails for folks who have spent multiple years in jail trying to fight their cases. Um, contrary to what you will see on television, um, trials take a long time. They can take many months, they can take years. And the system is actually built so that people will plead guilty whether or not they've committed a crime um, because the system actually can't sustain putting everybody on trial. Um, and so of course, as you could imagine, it is poor people who are most often punished um, for being poor and incarcerated prior to um, their trials. Um, and when we first started this, we were really excited because we actually received a lot more donations than we ever thought that the com community would offer. And it was also at the time um, when the Trump administration was really targeting Im Im immigrants, um, in particular through detention. Um, and so we started using our funds also to bail out Muslims who are in immigration detention. Um, so that is work we've been doing. We've bailed out 38 uh, Muslims from immigration detention and pretrial incarceration in these last two years. We've spent about $300,000 um, in bails. Um, this year, we are currently fundraising to bail more people out. We have spent all the money we have raised in Zakat. Um, we currently have two cases we're considering in immigration detention and two cases we're considering um, here in Chicago and Cook County Jail. Um, of course, the COVID situation has made being incarcerated that much worse. Um, folks who are incarcerated recognize what it means to be isolated, recognize what it means to not have the freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Um, and at the same time, they're also trying to fast and worship and do all the things that we, we continue to be able to do on our own time. Um, so that's something we've been working on a lot this Ramadan in particular, trying to reach out to folks who are incarcerated so that they don't feel quite so isolated. Um, so let me go back now after I've told you what we actually do to why we do it. Um, as a society in the United States, we spend $182 billion a year on the sort of criminal punishment system. This system you know, calls itself a justice system, but what it does is not impart justice. It is based on punitive measures towards punishment. It is not about restoring individuals. It is not about self-transformation. Any self-transformation that happens in prisons is despite the actual conditions of prisons. Um, I think the Muslim community is really unique in that um, we have 
we actually have, um, there's actually a lot of possibility and potentiality in incarceration. Um, you know, we have great stories of our beloved brother Malcolm um, and others who have been incarcerated and went through, met, um, you know, important transformations who became um, really important and significant figures um, through the process of being incarcerated. Um, and so, at the same time that we want to undo this system of incarceration, we also recognize that Islam does a particular work in jails and prisons for self-transformation. And with that, we want to reduce the stigma that people actually um, have um, when they come out of prison and, and try to enter a mosque community. And you know, people think that because they've converted in prison that they are not actually real Muslims. And we actually find that um, those who, uh, become Muslim in prisons are amongst the best of believers. Um, a number of our volunteers who work in the prisons have said they that they are actually, this is where they've actually seen um, Islamic faith at its highest and at its best um, is in the prisons. Um, but besides that, we what we believe is that we fundamentally need to have a society that isn't about punishment, isn't about isolating people from each other, um, taking people's time, taking people from their communities. Um, we actually need to build a society in which prisons and policing aren't necessary, right? And we actually don't think they're necessary now, but in terms of people thinking about, oh, what about a person who's done this? Or what about a person who's done that? We actually believe that if we create a community, if we create a society modeled after the prophetic community where people have everything that they need, that they have support, that they are raised, if you, that we raise young children to reach their full potential, that we provide everyone with their most basic needs, the amount of sort of quote unquote criminal activity would be radically reduced, right? So when we try to imagine um, what these kinds of communities look like, it's really about reimagining what safety is, reimagining what healthy communities actually are, what supportive communities actually are. This means that we actually take care of each other, that we don't outsource care to um, the state, right, which we often tend to do and that the state could be better utilized to provide for us on in a way that isn't penalizing, right? That isn't about protecting the most wealthy, or protecting the most powerful um, at the expense of those who are the most vulnerable. Um, and Dustin, tell me what my time is like. Okay, cool. Um, you know, and I think when we think about who our society criminalizes, who our society incarcerates, it tends to be those who do not have power, right, in our society. When we think about um, who's actually in prison, right, do we, do we know that the people who are the most powerful, who have, um, who have crushed those with less power, who have stolen from those with less power, are those the people who end up in prison? No. Um, when people come out of prison, are they reformed? Are they better? Are they given access to resources so that they can actually rebuild their lives? Are they not penalized for having records? Um, this is something our society does not do. If you come out, um, if you have a felony record in our society, if you have a criminal past, you are not given the second chances that supposedly the system is supposed to give. If you have a felony, you have a harder time finding a job. You have a harder time getting educated. It's much harder to get scholarships. Most often than not, you're not eligible for those kinds of things. If for housing, there are a lot of places people with felony records aren't able to live. Um, you know, and if we want to imagine a society where everyone has a chance to flourish, um, where everyone feels safe and feels healthy and feels secure, um, prisons and police have not been the answer to these um, situations. Um, and oftentimes when we speak about being abolitionists, when we think, speak about wanting to imagine a world without prisons and policing, people are like, can you justify why you think that way? And we never ask the criminal punishment system to justify itself, right? It has become normalized in our thinking that this is something that we need, that prisons and policing are natural, 
right? That they are part of human order and the way we should organize our societies. And that's just simply not the case, right? Much, Miriam, and we wanted to, uh, you know, announce today also that that inshallah we're going to be joining with the uh, the believers bailout to with the work that we've been doing around the border mosque to help raise more funds through the border mosque for a re a refugee and immigrant focused um, bail fund as well, and so we're going to be doing that here in these last few days of Ramadan. But we feel like it's really important because we we literally I, I get texts, I receive calls. Ismahan tells me the same. Sister Ramla from Pana tells me the same. People doing this work nationally. You know, there's a really amazing organization here called Alotro Lado, and I'll give you a good example. They tweeted last night that they were thrilled to report that they had won a bond for a client who had been detained at, at, at Elantro for six months, which is, a there's all these different detention centers here near the border. Our client came from Pakistan to visit his brother on a valid travel visa. This is someone traveling on a travel visa, which could happen to any Muslims who have family internationally who come to visit them, which is a lot of people. The border patrol canceled his visa on arrival because they didn't believe he stated reason for coming to the United States. They held him in a, in a cold, sterile waiting room for hours before questioning him and threatening to immediately deport him. When airport CBP threatened him with deportation back to Pakistan, he expressed how scared he was to go back and so he was transferred to the detention center. They were able to win that case, but now there's a $10,000 bond to get him out, right? And the thing with Muslims in these detention centers, and Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, people of different faith, is they're also treated differently than Christians are. Oftentimes, they're not given access to their texts. They're not given access um, to, to any of the, their religious rights, maybe in an inability to pray. And we were, when we were working with a Muslim lawyer um, at the beginning of this year, when we were really going to focus on trying to get people free, this brother Nicholas in Colorado, who had been working with Al-Otrolado, he had been meeting with different Muslim clients in uh, Otay Mesa, which is one of the largest detention centers in the United States. And they had told him that there's upwards of 100 Muslims in that detention facility in that single detention facility. But I know, going back to you, Miriam, you talk about how uh, detention, uh, you know, get it, these, these, these immigrant bails are the most expensive and sometimes the most difficult. So, that, so we need to be able to, realistically, we need to raise into the millions of dollars to be able to do this work at the scale we need to be at. Because if you, because look, and the other thing is MLFA and CARE do not do this work. They don't, right? They don't do, work in detention centers. And so can you talk more about that and the need that, uh, of what you've seen so far with this? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that actually really shocked us is that we were bailing out actual abolitionists. We've bailed out a number of brothers in particular from Mauritania, um, which supposedly abolished slavery um, a couple decades ago, it was one of the last countries to do so, but hasn't been enforcing um, those rules. And so we had people who were seeking asylum in the United States because they were actually fighting like contemporary slavery in Mauritania. Um, and so this was something for us that was really important to get the word out about, right? That um, I think, you know, and I think this goes back to also thinking about who are we now as Muslims in the United States that we can see that putting pe people in cages is actually a solution to any social problem that we have, right? Like how can we, you know, how have we become like other Americans who can like stand by and not pay attention to the fact that we're putting children in cages or we're putting men and women in cages, that we're separating people from their families. Like w in what world is that actually a solution to any problem, right? And so I think we need to check our own humanity, right? Um, to think about how we can think, how we can kind of continue our everyday lives and not be enraged and act on this issue, right? You know, I think it's, it's a real dissonance that we deal with on our everyday levels that we're seeing and hearing these stories and that we also have to move on with our everyday lives, you know, in some way to, in, you know, to manage our own senses of security and ability to sustain ourselves and our families. But at a certain point, we also have to really stop and think about what are we doing as a community, right? Like, I'm not going to fight someone who wants to build a mosque in their community, but could we think about what a couple million dollars would do 
towards freeing people, right? The Quran actually asks us multiple times to free a captive, to feed a captive, right? Um, wayfarers, those who are traveling, we know people who are traveling are vulnerable, right? This Pakistani brother is a key example, right? Of someone who needs a Muslim community to reach out and support him, right? And I think a lot of the media around um, sort of the dehumanization of who people are at the borders, who people are are in our prisons, right? It really goes a long way to dehumanizing us, right? To not see that this is profoundly unjust and that we are actually obligated to respond in these situations, right? Um, and you know, for us, it's also a real conundrum of how do we not only bail people out, but actually stop this system, right? So we could keep raising, you know, millions and millions of dollars and keep, you know, bailing folks out. But in the end, we actually, what we need to be doing is while we do that work and really, and this is how we approach money bail. Like we don't want to be paying money. Like we don't want believers bailout to last for decades. We actually want to, to make a world in which we are no longer necessary, right? That, and actually in Illinois, there are all these efforts to end money bond now, right? But at the same time, we don't want it to be replaced with a system that still maintains a certain level of injustice, that still maintains an unequal justice system for those who are poor, those who are racialized and criminalized, and those who are wealthy and powerful, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely we need to respond right now, raising money for bail. But we also need to become active and actually take a stand against, you know, the incarceration of people, right? The caging of people, um, putting them in dungeons and really stealing them from their communities, their families, their lives. Uh, it's in the or in the Quran talk about if you to save a person as if you saved all of humanity. And here literally is opportunities because don't tell me any other system where someone who is imprisoned or someone, especially, especially people seeking asylum as well, people coming from throughout the world, many cases, problems that the United States has created, like the drug wars throughout Latin America, which are foundationally an American problem based on our own drug consumption. This is an opportunity to save people's lives because they're fleeing for their lives. In many cases, family members have been killed you know, whole communities have been have been destroyed because of what of what these wars have done, or or obviously the wars in Syria and throughout the world that we see. And yet we, you know, people are discarded, Muslims are banned. And then we we why should we be surprised that blessings would be taken away or that these great these types of difficulties would enter into our world like we see right now? Um, you know, so Allah save us, inshallah. So Jazakallah, her sister, sister Maryam. I don't know if you have. So yeah, you can you get can you tell everyone where to go to to give to to believers bailout? We have a launchgood.com campaign. So it's launchgood.com uh, backslash BBO twenty twenty. Um, you can also just search for believers, and we're one of the first ones that comes up. Um, and then also check out our website, believersbailout.org, and then. Our social media team has been on fire this year. And so we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so we're very easy to find. You just have to come look for us. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. And see you, see you soon, inshallah. So, and next, you know, this is a really beautiful program. And like I said, inshallah, it's the first of four. And unfortunately, some of our, our super global friends couldn't make it today because the issue with trying to do global programming are time zones. Uh, and, and the fact that people are like, yo, I'm trying to break my fast, <laughs> or I just went to bed at 2 a.m. and you want me to wake up in a few hours, like Peter Gold from Australia, who was supposed to be with us today. But, um, but last but certainly not least is our, is our brother, who was who 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 was who was global and now he's local so local that he's in his his sheltering in place in San Francisco. Mokhtar Al Kanchali uh, is an entrepreneur. I knew him when he was a community organizer, so I'll always say that he was he's still a community organizer. He's the founder of Port of Mocha. 
uh, and just a global good builder. He's one of, alhamdulillah, my best friends and, you know, one of my former roommates. So I always got to keep it real uh, when, you, when, you, when you see your friends and when you're speaking to your friends this way as well. So, so yeah, Mokhtar, we wanted you to talk about really the, the, the future of, of Yemen talk about the future of, of coffee, right? In a moment where distribution channels are gonna become very, are becoming difficult, where food is becoming difficult. I think there's so much that you could talk to us about. So so go ahead and take it away. How are you, how are you doing? It's scary. A lot of my friends who have coffee shops, uh, a lot of my friends who have restaurants and small businesses, it's tough times because, you know, most of us are just going month to month. No one has these kind of deep pockets to have that much cash reserve. And so the reality looks pretty bleak at that. I don't think this is going to be uh, resolved anytime soon. You know, maybe in a couple of months, things might start to ease up and open up, but we're not going to be shaking hands for a pretty long time. And uh, I think from a business side, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of consolidation. A lot of these giant conglomerates who have the deep pockets are going to survive and you know, the small mom and pops, you know, we're not, it's going to be very hard for us. That doesn't mean that there isn't any hope. I think that the ones that are going to survive, like for instance, in my situation in coffee, coffee for many people is a vital good. You know, most people like myself, I can't survive without having my cup of coffee in the morning. It's probably when I get up almost every morning. And so the, the, the demand is not changing, but the route coffee takes to get to people, that is starting to change and going definitely more digital. And so I think this there are going to be a few companies, the ones that are agile, the ones that make that pivot, that pivot are going to be able to survive. Uh, and I, you know, I hope to be one of those companies myself. And so it's interesting seeing that aspect of it. Um, and I don't know, it's just, uh, I'm just trying my best. What I do a lot is I have these different WhatsApp groups, right? So I have WhatsApp groups with my farmers and other producers in different countries. So from a producer's perspectives, my friends from Kenya, from Rwanda, uh, Ethiopia, I just got off the phone just, just minutes ago with a uh, in Colombia. And the reality is a lot of importers, a lot of roasters, because they can't supply to restaurants who are closed, they can't, people can't come to their stores because of quarantine. You have countries that are in complete quarantine. You know, our roasters in Kuwait right now, for instance, they're on a, a 20 day shutdown. You can't leave your house even. You have, I think 30 minutes a day just to go around your neighborhood, but no banks, no post offices. So it's pretty severe. So they're limiting the amount of coffee they're buying. And, and, and so that's an issue. My roaster friends and my WhatsApp groups, it does help to kind of co-commiserate and speak to them and understand what their struggles are. There've been some like good news of companies that started to engage online through social media, doing online engagements uh, and set up their company in a way where their coffee can be delivered through third-party apps, directly through them, curbside pickup. Uh, and so some of them have actually noticed a spike in their sales uh, and have been able to kind of survive I know for me, our B2B wholesale program is pretty much slow right now, but uh, we've been thinking that we have a small e-commerce store and people are able to buy directly from us online and we can ship it to them. And so it's been really helpful to, to do that. Yeah, it's it's challenging, but uh, you know, I think we should, people of faith, we always have this sense of tawakkul, sense of, you know, we're just gonna, that's the thing about business too. It's it's a lot of you have a lot of a lot of twinkle, and so we're trying to have that and balance that with tying our own camels. Are your you know one of the you said you have all these WhatsApp groups. How are your farmers doing in Yemen? You said something interesting to me when we talked. I think last weekend where I said, "Man, is what's up with Yemen? How is how is the quarantine there?" And I think you said, "Well, Yemen's been on lockdown for six years, right?" And so, can you talk about? how Yemen is doing, how your farmers are doing, and, and, and what you see happening in Yemen. Yemen was one of the last countries, I think there were like six or seven countries that didn't get the virus. And Yemen was one of the last ones that, that received, I think the first case was about a week and a half ago. And it's probably because we've been quarantined in a lot for like the last six years. It's our reality that the airports are shut down and uh, there's no real way to go into the country, the very limited routes. 
then there was one flight that we, we would take from Egypt and so forth. Um, but now, unfortunately, the cases have have come out in Aden, even in one in Sana'a, Hadramaut, and it's from all the countries that are going through through this situation, Yemen could possibly be the most catastrophic. Um, there are many factors, Yemenis, for instance, we don't, I think the whole country has about 400 ventilators. That's it. Uh, uh, there are no, there are no oxygen manufacturing companies or, or factories. Those are all been bombed. Um, and so there is just the infrastructure is it wasn't there before, and it's definitely not going to be able to be there for this. Our farmers, they you know they mo live in the rural areas in the faraway communities, away from the violence. But the, much of the infrastructure of the country has been destroyed: the roads, the bridges, uh, these factories, and so adding COVID nineteen into this equation is just you know I I I try not to think about the negative aspects of it because it's very dark. And I'm trying to always, you know, push to something positive. I have to be honest with the reality of what's going on there. So inshallah, you know, we pray that this virus is contained and that uh, something can happen because, uh, I mean, Yemen is in a situation where it's in a free fall. And this is just something that will, it could possibly like ignite a, a horrible forest fire. Yeah, inshallah, Allah protect the people of Yemen, inshallah. But, um, but did but isn't the war for the most part the war has at least stopped for the time being correct not really no not at all um i think what they tell us months ago there was a, an, a i mean they were going to they announced a truce on the on the saudi side the saudi arabian government announced the truce um a few days later uh there was a rocket attack through Saudi border, a drone, drone attacks over to Saudi border, and Saudi Arabia retaliated, you know, very severely with airstrikes and bombing. About two days ago, actually, another airstrike, you know, killed and, and it was able. It actually um, bombed a humanitarian truck full with, you know, medical supplies uh, in an area called Al Bayba. Um, so these are still occurring. There's there's violence within Yemen within different factions. The island of Sokatra, last week there was uh, this militia, a general defected from the national army and tried to take over the island for another foreign government. And there was horrible clashes happening. And that was sad because Sokatra, for the most part, this beautiful island off of Yemen has been away from any violence. And, and it's just the situation is not great at all. So I, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's a sad space. And so there are a few projects in Yemen. There are copies, you know, one example of a way that material support could be sent to people in Yemen. Um, and there are other, there are a few others, but Yemen right now, anyone, you know, we just, we need to start thinking of our, our paychecks. When I get my paycheck every month, 10% of it, I'm going to use on small businesses in my neighborhood, restaurants, you know, cafes, buying gift cards, you know, this percent of it should go to um, supporting people in Yemen. Uh, that's how I think about it. You know, I need to thought, you know, it's a, we're all going through situations together. And because we don't work or live in a global society where people are treated more importantly than in corporations, we cannot rely on governments to do this social um, support and safety net. Uh, we as consumers have to do that. And as people who have, especially people of faith, we have the, the money to do this. So just think about this is not our money. You know, today we got we receive this money from God. Maybe we were we would be in a different situation if something else happened to us. And so that's how I'm trying to see it for myself and the people around me. Into community institutions, the reality is all we're going to be left with are corporations, right? So like Nestle slash Blue Bottle, these types of entities will survive. But will all the local, you know, coffee shops survive? There's a right here. There's a where I live in, San, in the part of San Diego I live in. There's a coffee shop where this guy has been manning his coffee shop this entire time by himself, trying to stay open. Serve, you know, selling on on a point of sale on his app, you know, and just struggling. But literally every day by himself, no staff to stay open. And that's the level of struggle that, that that people are going through right now. I wanted to ask you one more thing before before we get off. Um, 
you know, more, you know, one of the, a lot of the things we're interested in, of course, you represent so much of it, global Muslim impact, um, you know, how we create change around the world. And then of course your narrative change and, and storytelling. And you were really blessed to be, you know, to, you had this amazing book written about you uh, with your life about written by Dave Edgars. And I was, I was blessed to, to be next to you in parts of that and to see it transform and then be changed into a book and to see what that process would look, had looked like. And now, you know, we were living together the year the book came out. So I was able to see what that was like for you, you traveling around the world, mashallah, and, and really, you know, telling your story and telling the story of coffee in Yemen and the Muslim roots of coffee. But I don't think the conversation we haven't had is now, you know, a year and a half later, how many languages has the book been translated into? What is the continued response uh, that you're getting from people around the world to your story and to, and to what that, the, port, the, the, the monk of Mocha has meant to people? It's really, uh, it's still very much surreal for me. I never thought in my life I would ever have my story told this way and people would know about about the work I do or any work I, that I do for that matter. In the beginning, you know, you, you know this, it was just a weird thing. I told the author, I didn't, I don't know what you would write about. I don't have interest in life and I don't, I don't see the value in this, but it's been really wonderful seeing people's reactions. It's not easy putting yourself out there. You know, your, your story is your most personal asset and you need to be careful about who, who you give that to. And I don't, you know, I, I look far from perfect. It's very, you know, there's embarrassing, there's hardships, and there's things that, like, I can't read about the book now because there's certain parts of it that it's hard for me to relive and things I had to experience. But uh, for me, when I think the first event I did, I remember it was the first person who came to me who had read the book. It was actually the, the, the publishing house, the agent we have at Penguin Random House. And she said, I can't, I did not know coffee came from cherries and trees. And so I was like, wait, like, and this is a person who drinks coffee every day. Uh, and so when I look up the hashtags and people you know, tag me and post, they read the book and they say things like, you know, I'm never going to look at my cup of coffee the same way again. I can't believe there's so many hands involved in this one cup. Why isn't it $100 a, a cup? These are things that really like warm my heart that people finally realize like the actual cost of uh, this commodity, this coffee, this product that we don't take for granted every day. So it was nice, it was amazing for me just to see people appreciate that cup of coffee, whether it comes from Kenya or Yemen or Indonesia, but to know like, you know, the work that this barista does, this it's a crazy journey. It's a long journey that crosses so many hardships to make its way to us. Um, and, and also for me, Yemen is probably one of the most uh, misunderstood countries in the world. And in the West, people have a negative assumption towards Muslims, towards Arabs, and especially towards Yemen, if they know about Yemen. So to have people engage with uh, culture through a beverage, it's really powerful. It really opens that up for people. And then I think books are an incredible way to learn about other people. You know, I myself as a kid, I had a hard life and growing up it was not the best environment I lived in. I would run away from my reality through books. I loved Harry Potter. You know, I loved books that took me away from my life. And books, they do that. They let you live a different life to experience a different, a different uh, experience. And in many ways, people began to humanize us as Muslims, understand our struggles going through the airport. There are parts of my book that people, when they read, like, wow, I didn't know that you guys had to go through, go through this, these, these difficulties. As a Muslim, as an immigrant, you know, our parents come in this country and what they had to go through. Uh, and so there are different parts of the book, I, but at some point, it, the, my intention went from it went from trying to humanize us to these other, you know, non-Muslim, other European folk, to this is we are actually producing our own culture. And I felt that the the, the audience that I really connected with the most, and really and the ones that were impacted for me the most, were my own people. Young Muslims, young immigrants struggling, you know, and po through poverty, struggling through class hardships, struggling through misunderstanding of them in their in their in their high schools and being bullied, you know, their parents and the division and the friction between them and their parents, people, millennials trying to figure out their own path in life and what direction to take, and those are the ones that really like when I read those messages, it really makes tears tears me up because I feel 
it felt like I feel like wow, this is like I didn't never expect that kind of connection with somebody, and that's why I think you know it it helps the book. I don't look perfect in it, and people can engage. I don't know how many languages it's been translated into. I know it's a few, and you can go online and find them. But you know, readers in in Spain or in like uh, South Korea, Poland, Russia, Germany, Holland. It's just like a you know, an, an Arabic version just came out, and that was really I was being nervous because you know, there's a lot of really embarrassing things about things I went through in life, and I never thought that my family, my people in Yemen, would eventually know these stories. <laughs> so. It's a little weird, and on a personal note, I hope this is like I feel like this is a safe space, and because you're doing this, I can be a little bit more real. You know, people coming up to me and and think they think that they know me or that they like understand me because they read a book. It definitely talks about a, a portion of my life and something I went through, but it's not like that's not my whole life. There are people that are not in the book that you know the experiences that I, that I'm still experiencing now, um, and also just like when people get some little bit of notoriety. You, you, they assume you live a certain lifestyle or things are a certain way, but you know, it's not that glamorous and it's actually in many ways very hard. You know, here I am, and I'm trying to figure out how to support my farmers and do this work I'm doing and people assume that I've made it or they assume that you have some level of success, but you realize that when you go to a certain level, you just get more problems and more issues, especially when you're still you know, struggling to make that. But I'm very, very happy that in, in my life has had some, some purpose in it. I'm happy that I found the call in that, uh, I mean, the, the thing is there's so many problems we have in our world today. And I think everyone has the opportunity to find one problem to try to solve, try to create an industry, try to create a product or service to deal with an issue you have. And I think com companies that have founders who, um, I'll end with these last two points, companies that have founders who, who try to solve problems based on core, like values, deep meaning, with deep meaning. Those are the ones that are going to survive because you will face a lot of obstacles. If you have a drive that's more material and you just want to make money, you're gonna face problems and it's not worth the money. But if you have a deeper meaning, a deeper intention behind what you do, it's, it, you, it's worth more than the cost of materially. Like, you know, there are points where what I do I don't make enough money to cover certain things, but I feel that I like this life. I feel like I'm being used in a better purpose. The second thing I want to end with is I really hope, well, actually two more things. If you are a founder, if you are a person that you know, works in business, I, and or in general, I think people should think about mental health much more seriously. It took me a long time to get around it, but having a therapist, you know, it sounds kind of weird paying someone to listen to you, but listen, like you need to know, you need to have knowledge of yourself. And that's what a therapist does. They, they help you understand yourself, understand what are your insecurities? Where do they come from in your life experiences? There's these patterns that we, that we live through. And once you start to understand yourself and analyze yourself, you will know how to interact with people much more positively. You have a better life. It's really about learning about, about yourself and your, your challenges. And we all have gifts and then figuring out what those gifts are too. And the last thing I want to mention before we bounce out of here is really support your local businesses. This is not happening in two or three months or not. This is people are filing for bankruptcy in real time. Companies and restaurants that you love to go to for you and your family, grandparents, they're being wiped out. I think if things continue the way they are, maybe 75% of small businesses are going to collapse. So as uh, anyone listening to this, like, just think about your paycheck, support local restaurants, restaurants, businesses, cafes, anything. A lot of these people are very prideful and, and it's hard for someone to ask for a handout sometimes, but really support them. They're going to get through this phase. We're going to get through it only if we think collectively, um, what, what, what is mine, you know, if I'm in a better position now, be thankful, be blessed, make sure you give back. Um, because it's really, it's, it's not, unfortunately, like I mentioned, we don't have systems in place, governmental systems that are going to take our interests in the most positive way. You know, unfortunately they're looking into a policy that helps corporations more and these giant conglomerates. And I think as consumer, as consumers, we can flip that, right? We can decide where does our money go for, go to, who am I going to support with my money? Um, and if you're going to get fast food, fast fashion, fast coffee, 
that's not that's soulless. That's just really it's it's, it's going to be bad quality first of all. But you're not doing something positive. Support local you know businesses, buy from local people, and uh, you know that's my last message that I would like. If anything that gets out there. And it's great to see you, Mokhtar, and and may Allah bless the people of Yemen and bless your business and bless all the small business owners and people around the world who are really, really struggling to keep their businesses afloat. And we know we thank all the speakers that came came on this program today. Like I said, this is the beginning for the Center for Global Muslim Life, what we've been building over the last month. Um, you know, it's a continuation of the work that I've been doing over the last five years, but now with the Center of Global Muslim Life as a nonprofit, uh, California-based, globally-oriented uh, nonprofit. And so you can give to us on our LaunchGood page, which is uh, launchgood.com backslash build global Muslim life. And yeah, and we ask everyone, we ask for Allah's blessing on everyone and protection for all of us. And Dr. Allah, hey, do you have any, any closing du'as, Mokhtar? Right now for you, Dustin. I've known Dustin for a long time. And if I had to, to describe you, it's you're someone who cares about the global Muslim identity. Since I met you, that's been your, your call. And you wanted to do something to help the greater Muslim community around the world globally. And you've been trying to do that through, through the digital and technology experiences we have available around us. So if you're listening out there, this is his life's work. I believe in the work he does. Support if you can. Um, I think that you know there's a, there's a powerful thing about being the, with the word ummah. I remember from your first publication that you did ummah wide. You know, I had the honor of being interviewed on that, and it's this has all been a continuation of the same um, uh, journey that Dustin's been on. So I, I'm I'm really excited to see how things work out, and I know that the community listening on right now they're going to support. Uh, I will just you know end with uh, um, I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the merciful, the glorious, the magnificent, to bless us. And to allow us to follow the truth and see the truth as it should be seen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of courage, to fight our own demons and the demons out there in the world we live in. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always allow us to be optimistic and to be optimistic of His bounty and His mercy. And I ask Allah to ease the suffering of all those around us who are dealing with things economically, health wise, socially, whatever difficulties they may have. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept us, inshallah. I mean. Be back on Friday, May 22nd for the next program, and we hope to see you all there. Assalamu alaikum.